Thank you, Andy. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, just before I start introducing Moita, um, Andy will come back again at the beginning of, at the end of the um, uh, Moita seminar. Sorry, I lost Zoom for a second. So I was just wondering whether you're all still there. You are good. Um, so this is the first of our crime justice and society seminars uh, this semester. Uh, my name is Milena Tripkovic and I'm a lecturer in criminology here at Edinburgh Law School. Um, and it's a great pleasure today to chair this session. Um, today we welcome Moita Plesnicar, who joins us from uh, the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And just to briefly introduce uh, Moita, she's a research associate at the Institute of Criminology and is also assistant professor at the University of Ljubljana. Um, after she finished her undergraduate studies um, of law in Slovenia, Moita did her master's degree um, in criminology at the University of Oxford and then subsequently completed her PhD in Slovenia. And since that time, uh, she frequently visited a number of research institutions abroad, such as the University of Trieste, the University of Cambridge, and the University of Warwick. Um, she has led and participated um, in more projects that I can actually count, and has published on varied criminological and legal topics, um, such as um, the criminal process, criminal policy, sentencing, punishment, prisons, women offenders, sexual offenses, and so on. So I told you a lot of things. But I also want to say something else. Um, having known Moita for more than 10 years now, uh, I can only describe her as a type of um, criminologist that criminologists today should strive to be. Uh, while she's firmly entrenched in Slovenian uh, research and academia, where her work has had notable impact on legislative change, her frequent communication and cooperation with um, researchers abroad um, have also allowed her to reflect on domestic policies and practices to find optimal solutions uh, to pertinent domestic prob problems and induce change. But I think most importantly, um, and I've known that for a long time, she's someone who is very much aware of the positive sides and elements of policies and practices in her country and who works persistently to find ways to just export uh, those good things abroad. And I think that's a very important thing. So for that reason, she, for me, is a criminologist who crosses the borders with ease and elegance. Today, um, she will present one such um, in innovative and I really think paradigm shifting um, idea. Um, Moitz is very happy if you keep your cameras on so, she, so that she can have um, communication with us. Dobrodošla u Edinburgh, Moitz. Thank you, Elena. You've made me emotional a bit. So oh. It's going to be hard to, to kickstart um, after that. But I think this part is sort of a purgatory for, for a presenter, you know, waiting for people to talk about you and, and, and looking at how everyone's reacting is just not, not, you know, not the best thing. So I'm just going to get over it um, and, and start with the presentation. Um, before, um, that's, this is it. This, Okay, so you should be seeing um, something now, right? Yeah. Um, so before um, I actually begin, um, this is very much a work in progress. Um, it's, it's the beginning of the idea. So um, don't, um, don't be surprised if there are loose ends, but more than that, there are probably loose beginnings <laughs> to start with. So um, um, I will be really, really happy, um, as opposed to sometimes when you think things through and, and think that you have it figured out um, and, you know, comments are more of a nuisance. <laughs> um, this is an, uh, the opposite of that. So I'm really actually looking forward to um, criticism and comments um, to help me um, move, move forward. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a potential map of sentencing. I'm not even quite sure whether this should be plural, it probably should be a maps of sentencing, um, but we'll get to that um, later on. Um, first, I want to start with London. Um, London is a very unattainable um, um, <laughs> concept right now for many of us. <laughs> um, but still, if we, you know, if we think about London and what life in London is about, um, there are several, of course, um, um, ways of how to how to get there. Um, a map, I think, is always a useful um, um, tool um, to to approach um, an idea because it gives you some sort of layout of how how things look and how they are. So there's a map of London, um, and it tells us um, 
some important things about London. It tells us where the river is, when you know some of the landmarks are, uh, when the roads go, um, and so on. And when we see this map, we think, well, yeah, we know something about London now. Um, but then, you know, there are other maps of London. Um, there is the bus map. Um, which is kind of different than the, the earlier one, but it gives us information about the same place. Um, there's the, the tube map, which again gives us information about the same place, but in a very, from a very different perspective. It, it goes underground, and it's not the only thing that's underground. There's the sewage lines underground, which is a, a rather, you know, unorthodox thing. Uh, um, um, concept uh, when thinking about London, but it's there and it's it's something that makes up London. Um, there's, um, of course, a satellite view, which, um, depending on how it, interactive it is, um, can give you an insight about how things are moving. There is, you know, you can use the roads um, and, and where, when there, where there's blockages and so on. Um, and, and this, again, uh, makes your, your um, concept about what, what London is richer and, and um, uh, livelier. Um, but then there's also more specific maps um, of London, of London, ones that talk about major attractions, uh, major landmarks. And those maps, uh, you know, there's several variants of them. They differ depending on who is making them, you know, for, for what purpose as well, but also for what kind of preferences they have. There's a map of murders in London. So places where murders in London have happened. Again, something very individual, but something that enrich, enriches the, the idea of what, what the place is. And there's, last but not least, a map of pubs in London, um, which again, is a very individual perspective, but again, gives us a richer idea of how the place looks and what life in this place might, might be like. So um, I think looking at one of these maps is helpful. Looking at several of these maps is probably more helpful. What would be really helpful is look at, a inter at an intersection of all of these maps. And this is something I'm completely unable to, to draw technologically. So this is, this is what we're left with. Um, but, but in terms of ideas, looking at all of these maps at the same time is what gives you an answer about what London is really about and what London is really like. So what are the different maps that we use in sentencing? There's many. Um, these, these are not maps per se, these are ideas that maps that we use revolve around. One of the more um, important, the more researched, the more relevant ones is, is the idea of discretion. So how is discretion in sentencing structured? Um, is, is the decision maker allowed a, a, a broad um, spectrum of decisions, a broad spectrum of choices, or is it more limited and, and narrow? Um, another big cluster of, of, of um, maps, probably several of them, um, surrounds the idea of disparity. Um, so are um, sentencing, sentences that are being passed um, equal towards different strata of, of the population? Are there differences? Where do they come from? Uh, but then we have other um, maps, other ideas um, um, as well. There is the question of uh, you know, cognitive bias or bias or prejudice that, that relates somehow to disparity, but not necessarily equals it. Um, there's a question about um, sentencing policy and who creates sentencing policy and, and, and how sentencing policy interacts with, with different decisions. There's a comparative issue in sentencing. So how are different systems um, um, tackling the same idea? Um, and, and we could go on and on. Um, what started to frustrate me a bit um, when I started to think about this is um, that these maps that we have are very often very far removed from each other. So there's a lot of people doing sentencing research and there's a lot of people doing sentencing research on um, 
substantive law um, questions of sentencing. This is what we would say on the continent, in, in continental systems. So on questions of um, how um, discretion is, is structured or, um, you know, how, how is, um, what do you do with multiple offenders, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of, it, it's, it's a bit derogatory, but I don't mean it in that way. Like the minutiae about sentencing, um, how, how things uh, um, are settled within the, the legal framework. There's a lot of researchers doing research about um, disparity, um, looking at race, looking, looking at gender, um, looking at various um, characteristics of the offender, of the victim, and, and of the judge, and, and, and all together. But these strands of research are quite often as separate as this, as this little, um, it's not a square, it's a hexagonal or whatever it is. So they are, they are quite separate from each other. And this started to bother me. And I said, well, you know, uh, I was quite proud of myself for thinking about this. And then I looked at the literature. Of course, I wasn't the first one who thought about, about this, um, you know, some sort of space between um, different research ideas. Uh, there's Almer, who's done um, um, quite a lot about it. Um, there's Joe Dixon, who's also written about it. And, and there's others um, pointing that out. Um, so what I wanted to think about is how could we what kind of framework could we use to bring these different, different um, research agendas um, um, closer? And I'm thinking again, going back to, to the London map, um, about different levels, um, different, different uh, yeah, levels that, that we think um, are relevant in sentencing. And when we think, um, and I separately, this is, pretty much arbitrary. I, I, I decided what goes above, what goes beyond, uh, but I think it's helpful um, to, to, to uh, consider the questions that I want to open. So if we think about the above ground level, um, I, I put there um, ideas and notions that we see, and we also think that have an impact on sentencing. So this would be um, you know, this main cluster of sentencing research, um, um, sentencing discretion, and, and so on, and so on. Um, and a, a lot of the time, or, or most, or probably all of the time, those ideas get structured through regulation. So we look at the regulation surrounding sentencing, um, what the law says, um, about how the judge is supposed to make the sentencing decision. Do we have guidelines? Do we have uh, sentencing ranges within the law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is in a way a uh, structure. So it's a structure within which the sentencer makes the decision, okay? The second level that's below the ground, so it's the underground level, is what we don't really see at first glance but we think and now already know that has impact. And this goes towards prejudice and bias and um, um, basically the, the, the psychology of decision-making. Um, so all the, the, the factors that influence the decision that come from within the sentencer, always, of course, um, in, in um, collaboration with, with the outside um, uh, factors, but come, they, generally they come from within. And this is what I, I somehow um, named the individual um, level. But then I think um, there's not only an interplay between the structural and the individual um, um, levels, they, there might be something in between that we don't regularly think about, um, which would be things that we, we see, you know, we, we know that, that those features are there, but don't necessarily think that they have an influence on sentencing decisions. Um, and this is basically the level that I'm going to be um, talking about um, in, in, the, in, um, in this presentation later on. Um, just to briefly go through the three levels again, you know, the psychology, I'm starting with this because I know the least about it. I'm a bit frustrated about knowing the least about it, but, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer by, by basic education, so you don't get too far ahead in psychology by being a lawyer. Um, but generally, you know, sentencing research in this area is quite broad. Um, thankfully, uh, psychologists are coming in and people from, from other backgrounds as well. Um, the main issue that, that the questions of psychology have clustered um, around um, is the question of disparity. So where do disparities come from and how are they, are they related to the individual characteristics of the decision makers? 
um, there's been a lot of research about prejudice, about cognitive biases, about uh, motivation and motivational um, thinking. Um, but there's also some uh, beginnings of research, or at least some, some research that could also be tied with sentencing. And if it hasn't yet, it's about to be. Um, so it's a question of, of routines and habits, uh, our habitual decision making, a question of stress and how that influences our decisions, even on sentences. Uh, the question of role models, the question of cultural psychology that brings in the comparative elements um, between um, different uh, sentencing systems. Um, so there's a lot of that and um, it is super interesting, but it's something that I, I don't feel quite comfortable um, um, lecturing on because I, I don't feel very um, equipped to do it. Um, I'm trying to get more equipped, but I'm not there yet. So I'm going to be talking about the next two levels more. Um, and th the second one is the law, the question of um, um, how the law shapes sentencing. Um, as a continental lawyer, uh, my mind immedi immediately goes to, you know, the, the structural divisions that we make um, within our laws. So the, the main division between the substantive law, giving you the, the, the substance of the law, and the procedural law, giving you the, the ways of how, how the law um, actually functions. Um, so substantive law, um, the main issue, as I said earlier, is how to structure sentencing discretion, but there's much more than that. And, and, and it's, all in, it's all very relevant. Um, it's a question of mitigating and aggravating circumstances, uh, a question of you know, sentencing multiple offenders. What types of sentences um, exist within a system and, and, and what types of sentences can a judge choose from um, for specific offenses? Because that differs sometimes. Uh, what happens with, with plea bargaining and guilty plea discounts and so on and so on. So it's a lot of substantial legal questions um, that shape um, the final sentencing decision. Um, I, I've drawn this blue line there because quite often this is where sentencing research um, somehow stops or, or this is where most of the sentencing research is based. Um, this is where, where most of the things happen. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that's a bad thing um, and, and I think research in this cluster is really, really super important. But I'm saying they there might be something beyond that blue line, and that something in in you know in the first instance is procedural sentencing law. Uh, there is so so little literature on sentencing procedure um, that one would think it's rather inconsequential or or you know uh, irrelevant. Um, and it might be so, but I don't really think it is. It's just that it hasn't really been done. Um, um, at a level that, that would um, um, come to, to you know, um, <laughs> academic literature. Um, the main, um, th there's a lot of issues relevant in sentencing procedure. There's the question of who makes the sentencing decision, the, the, you know, who is the decision maker? Is it a single judge, is it a panel? Is it, a, is it lay judges with a single judge? Is it only professionals, only lay judges? So a question of who, a question of um, sentencing procedure, um, you know, there's a big divide between um, common law systems where you have two distinct phases, um, one that ends with the verdict and the second one that ends with the sentence. In continental systems, you more or less never have these two phases. You only have one phase and, and one decision at the end that is simultaneously the one on, on guilt and the one on sentence. Um, there's a question of reasoning um, and how, um, how what kind of reasoning is required um, in uh, sentencing, in criminal uh, procedures with relation to sentencing. You have systems that require thorough, um, detailed um, reasons. You have systems that pretend to require thorough um, reasons, but really you know, are, are uh, quite accepting of, of anything that's written. And there are systems that don't really require any kind of um, um, reasoning or giving reasons um, about the sentence at all. Um, <coughs> there's questions of the standard of proof for, I don't know, mitigating and aggravating circumstances that has only really be, been tackled with regard to the capital sentence in, in the US, um, whereas for other questions, um, it's more or less unexplored. There's a question of um, um, uh, plea bargaining and, and its role um, in the sentencing procedure um, and, and, and what, what it does to the procedure itself. 
Then there's a third level um, of legal issues, I think. Um, and structural is probably not the best adjective. I'm, I'm happy for you to, to suggest me something uh, better. Um, but it's basically how the, the, the legal system, the, the judiciary, the, the criminal justice is set up um, within the legal system. So it's questions about, you know, what's the position of the judges in terms of their career? How are they? Um, how do they become judges? How do they progress in the um, judicial hierarchy? Um, but there's also a question about the prosecution and what kind of role the prosecution has within the, the criminal justice system, but also within sentencing specifically, because again, we have a, a comparatively, we have a very, very uh, wide, um, um, uh, um, we have a lots of different variants um, with, the, uh, with, with regard to how the prosecution plays out um, with sentencing. Either they propose sentences, either they basically do most of the sentencing through plea bargaining, or they have uh, very little role um, in sentencing at all. So there's a whole uh, range of possibilities. There's also a question of experts. So um, expert witnesses, for example, like psychologists or psychiatrists, but also uh, probation officers or, or um, social work um, um, employees, uh, so uh, social workers who may or may not have some input in, in the, to the final sentencing decision. Um, now, moving on, um, let's just put a pin in it and, and, and let me expand on, on an, another issue um, before we move on. Um, and that issue is, you know, decision-making. Um, there has been a lot of research into human decision-making, how we make choices, how we make decisions, what, what's really rational, what's not rational, et cetera, et cetera. I think one of the more accepted um, um, explanations of of how uh, decision making occurs is uh, Kahneman's um, idea about the, about the two systems, the system one and system two, one more automatic, one um, slow and deliberate, um, wh whereas the, the automatic one um, makes most of the decisions um, and is largely out of our control, which is basically fine for most occasions, but sometimes it's also not quite fine as well. Um, when, um, thinking about human decision making, we tend to accept um, this newfound knowledge um, and, and consider it as, as truth, as a given. Um, when we're trying to apply it to legal decision making, we have more um, um, reservations or more doubt sometimes. Um, not because uh, the, the theory wouldn't make sense, but because it somehow clashes with our idea of how the law should work and how legal decision making should work. Um, However, um, multiple um, um, growing research shows that actually, you know, professional decision making and legal decision making is as susceptible as um, as susceptible to these laws, if you want, of decision making, of human decision making, as every other decision making is. Um, and and Shower has this almost poetic passage where he says um, that the judge as a human being, the, the fact that the judge is a human being is the one that has the most impact on his decision making, not the fact that he's a lawyer, not the fact that he's a specific type, kind of lawyer or a judge, but the fact that he is um, um, a human. Um, within this framework, um, a, a strand of thought um, has grown uh, in the past um, decades, Dec uh, somehow, um, that, that's called choice architecture. Um, choice architecture is, a, is a, somehow um, a complex theoretical notion, but more than that, it's, it's usually a very practic practically oriented way of, of thinking about things. Um, th the main premise of choice architecture is that, that decisions are never made in a vacuum. That, that choices are made in a certain environment um, that, um, or, or a certain context, if you want, and that context is not neutral. It has impact on the, the choice that has to be made. Um, <coughs> you know, the most common um, example that um, Thaler and Sunstein give is the one of the cafeteria. Um, and uh, it's, it's like a cafeteria scenario where um, 
um, the, the people working in the cafeteria um, change the way they present their food. So instead of um, making more space or more prominent space for um, junk food and, and um, you know, quick bites, um, they give more room and more prominent space to vegetables and fruit and, and you know, water and so on. And by that, they somehow structure the environment to induce you to make the better choice. Um, there's a lot of um, issues about the, um, the um, ethics um, of you know, uh, structuring choice in this way and so on. But lucky for me, I don't really have to go into that uh, because I, I wanna think about choice architecture in a different way. Um, typically, when we transpose choice architecture to the legal environment, to the law, uh, the questions that are asked are, can or more than that, should the law nudge? Nudge is one of the tools that choice architectures use to make you choose something instead of another thing. So should the law nudge people to make right decisions? And of course, there's a lot of you know, controversy there. What is the right decision and, and who's the one deciding on that? And there is where the paternalism comes in. Um, how open is your choice to still make, how, how open um, uh, are your options to still make the choice that you actually want to, to make? And this is where the libertarian comes in. So it's a concept. Thaler and Sunstein talk about libertarian paternalism, which is you know, kind of gently letting you know, um, pushing you towards the right choice, but, but not still letting you make the wrong one if you want to. Um, this has um, drawn quite a lot of criticism from various um, theorists, from philosophers maybe, I think, um, talking about um, how this is not actually libertarian and it's, it's not actually paternalistic. <laughs> uh, but again, lucky for me, I don't really have to go there because I don't want to, you know, my question is not, is the environment um, or, or the, the, the choice um, architecture behind sentencing influencing individuals, um, um, you know, making uh, uh, law abiding or law disabiding um, citizens um, in making their criminal choices. I want to look at how this environment impacts the decision makers within the law. Um, so professional legal decision makers. And my question is, can the law avoid creating the environment in which decisions are made? And the question is rhetorical because of course the law is the one that makes the environment, it's the one that sets up. It's probably not just the law, but it's the law as well. Um, Young, Karen Young offers um, a helpful framework of how uh, decisions are structured. Um, um, within the law, um, and, and she, she has a passage where she says, you know, well, actually, law has structured decision-making since forever. This is what law does. It makes us do something and not other things. It gives us options uh, that are legal, but also by doing that, options that are illegal. Um, and and um, she offers these three different levels um, of structuring decision-making. Um, and one is coercion, which would be the typical legal rule that we think of, you know, um, um, a judge um, has to pass a mandatory sentence for, for some sort of um, um, offense. That a mandatory sentence is typical coercion um, in terms of it makes the decision maker make one specific choice. There is no choice, basically. Um, then Young talks about inducements. Um, that um, is a technique to which the choice architect, architect um, encourages the decision maker um, to engage in a desired action by offering them something, um, um, something in, 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 in return. So they, they benefit something by, by making that choice. Now, um, in, um, um, in legal decision making or in sentencing, in sentencing I don't think there are uh, specific inducements. You know, you, you, yeah. I mean, I can think of an example, but it's probably not what, what would be structurally um, uh, welcome. Uh, if you remember uh, about a decade ago, um, there was a case in Minnesota where two judges um, sentenced uh, a lot of uh, young offenders to uh, juvenile imprisonment um, and got paid in return by the private prison. Um, uh, that housed those, those young offenders after that. That would be a very direct 
you know, inducement. Um, someone, you know, the, the decision maker, the judge getting a reward, a monetary reward for making a certain sentence. But again, this is not something we would generally um, welcome or, or, or want to in a sentencing system. So I don't think the inducements are, are something that I can really work with, or at least not very direct inducements. Um, the third level that Young offers are nudges, um, and nudges are basically techniques through which the choice architect encourages another, uh, the decision maker, to make the desired action by arranging the choice environment in a way that makes them more likely to choose one um, route instead of the other. It doesn't um, directly give them any kind of reward in exchange for the decision, but it makes making that decision easier than making other decisions. Okay, this is very, you know, this is as far ago as I, this is as far into choice architecture as I go, that I stop and move towards sentencing again. So if we transpose the ideas of choice architecture to the sentencing framework, we get sentencing architecture, which is a very nice, you know, catchy phrase, um, but it, it gives us um, an opportunity to think about an environment the environment in which sentencing decisions are made and to think about how that environment shapes sentencing as well. Um, one of the main takes that I get out of choice architecture is that basically there is no neutral environment. Um, everything leads to something. The environment we have and might think is neutral is actually not neutral. In every environment that we have, some decisions are easier to make and some decisions are harder to make. Um, and and to, to not be conscious when creating that environment doesn't mean that that environment is not existent or is not there. It just means that we don't really know what we've created. Um, but to think about sentencing, um, I try to conceptualize what that environment um, could be made of. Um, and this is a, you know, it's, it's complex, I know, I'm sorry. I, I've been up all night making that, that, uh, that picture. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically on the left side of the screen, you have the sentencer, the decision-making. On the right side of the screen, you have the sentence, the, the decision that he has to make. The decision-making process is, you know, the, the blue arrow going from the sentencer to the sentence. The whole slide is the environment that um, encapsulates the moment or, or, or the, the decision that has to be made. And then if you see there's different clusters uh, colored with different shades of blue. Um, I started off with, they were all the, the same color <laughs> at the beginning, but then I, I somehow started to see that they, they might fit together um, in, in different clusters. So, Basically, the dark blue one in, in the bottom left um, are um, what we would um, generally call um, the, the substantive law. So basically the sentencing laws um, th that I spoke earlier about them being the more researched part of sentencing. So how, um, you know, how is uh, sentencing discretion structures? Do we have ranges? Do we have guidelines? Do we have grids? If you have a grid, then your, your, your decision is pretty structured. If you have a range, it, it's more loose, but it doesn't mean that that doesn't have an impact on your final decision. Um, there's the mandatory minimums or the three strikes laws um, that were in place for, for, for a quite long period. Um, you know, very much um, taking the judge into one specific direction with, with, the, with the decision. Um, there's the sentencing options, of course, the, you know, what, what kind of sentences can, can the decision maker choose from at all. Um, then the, the, the top left would be the sort of procedural um, um, questions. So uh, the questions of how the sentencing procedure is structured, what, what, what do we do with guilty pleas, um, do we have one phase or two phases, the things that I talked about earlier in the cluster of procedural law. The top right corner um, um, is the different influences uh, 
coming within the sentencing system from outside. So not, not specifically targeting the decision maker, not specifically targeting the sentence, but targeting the system as a whole. So what's the role of the prosecution? What's the role of the victim in sentencing? Do we have a victim impact statement? If we have it, what does that mean? It probably does mean something, and it's supposed to mean something um, towards the final sentence. What's the role of the public? You know, how publicized are the, the sentences um, and, and how aware are the decision makers about um, that publication? Uh, it's about um, um, call, court culture, about, about what's um, accepted within a given you know, um, um, court or, or, or area and what's not accepted and so on. And the final cluster in the bottom right um, are the questions that we don't, um, so, so that would be the structural law um, um, cluster that I talked about earlier. Um, what does a specific sentence mean for a specific decision maker's career advancement? You know, if in, in our system, for example, if um, first instance judges um, get a lot of appeals and if the court of uh, appeals uh, changes their sentences or, or changes their, their decisions, um, they don't specifically get a bad mark, but it, it, there's a track of that, there's a track record. And if that track record is not good, it means bad things for the judge's promotion um, through, through the career um, ladder. Um, it also, um, I, I would also put there um, questions about making your life as a decision maker easier like court administration, and as we'll see later on in one of the examples, when the judge, when at what precise moment is the, co is the case closed for the judge? This might be a very, very significant consideration when choosing a sentence, as we'll see later on. Um, and so on and so on. Oh, okay, uh, avoiding complications, again, making the lives of the, the decision maker less complicated. Um, if you have a remand decision that has been you know, taken much earlier in the process than sentencing actually um, occurs, um, and someone's been sent on remand uh, for a period of six months, um, research from various parts of the world shows that it is very unlikely for the sentencer to pass a sentence that would be less than six months um, in prison, which would be the equivalent of what has been served on remand. So, you know, making a decision that actually makes your life easier in terms of, oh, wait, if, if he was on remand um, and now I only think he should be punished by three months, it's, it probably means that there's going to be problems and I really don't want problems. So let's just make it six months. OK, so making a, a, a choice that is more acceptable, that is less troublesome for you. Um, I have two examples um, and, and then I'll wrap up. Um, the first example um, of how I think this choice architecture, uh, this sentencing architecture may work, is uh, passing a community sentence versus passing a conditional sentence in Slovenia. So Slovenia, uh, uh, probably, <laughs> well, you probably don't know a lot about Slovenia. Um, it is a very small country. Um, um, it, is, it was part of the former Yugoslavia. Um, but it is, it has often been termed exceptional um, in uh, the penological context and um, is very much in line with Scandinavia in those respects. So we have very lenient sentencing, um, not that many people in prison, still probably too many, but not that many. Um, um, it is quite exceptional in the sense that it differs quite a lot from other um, countries in its vicinity. Um, the prevalent sentence in Slovenia is the conditional sentence. So basically the judge, it's an admonitory sentence, uh, sanction. Um, it, it gives the judge the opportunity to say to the defender, you would go to prison for this, but I won't send you to prison if for the period of, I don't know, two years, you, you know, keep your head straight. If you stay out of trouble for the next two years, then you won't have to serve the sentence for this particular offense that you've already committed. And this is about 75% of um, 
of sentences in Slovenia are conditional sentences. So this is basically the default. The default is one of the basic tools of choice architecture. What is the easiest choice to make? And a conditional sentence in Slovenia is a default. If you have a given um, offense, so you have to have the right type of offense. Um, it the, the maximum for the, uh, the maximum um, sentence prescribed for the defense can't be over three years of imprisonment, and we have quite a lot of those of those um, offenses. Um, so if, if you have the right type of offense and you're a judge making a decision, unless you have some some sort of um, um, aggravating circumstances, it's pretty straightforward that your decision is going to be a conditional sentence. So what you have to do is basically make that choice, see if there's any kind of aggravating circumstances. If there's not, it's your easy way out. You have to determine the length and the probationary period. And then sometimes you have to give reasons, but more often than not, in these cases, you don't have to give reasons at all. Um, if there's no appeal, and there's usually no appeal, um, you don't have to give reasons at all for your sentencing decision. Um, as opposed to that, uh, think about passing a community sentence. If you want to pass a community sentence in Slovenia, you're in for a lot of trouble. It's like a hurdles run um, um, because you need to have the right type of offense. Okay. Um, community sentences in Slovenia are set as alternative sentences. And when I say alternative, I mean alternative to imprisonment. So you can't pass a community sentence directly. You first need to pass an imprisonment sentence, okay? which already means you deviate from your, your default decision, which would be a conditional sentence. right? So you have to decide, no, this warrants an imprisonment sentence. This passes the custody threshold. Um, once you do that, um, you need to um, determine the prison sentence and you need to give reasons for that. The, the likelihood of you having to give reasons for that is much higher because in imprisonment, uh, when imprisonment sentences are passed, um, uh, appeals are much more common. Um, then after that, there has to be a request from the defendant. It's not an, a, a decision, a, a community sentence is not a decision you as a judge can make on your own, but you need a request from the defendant, which you know makes the decision much more removed from your, your um, immediate surrounding um, than, than one would think. After you have a request from the defendant, you have to make a new decision about um, the fact that imprisonment that you've determined earlier on is necessary is actually not really necessary, and a community sentence will do. Um, and after you do that, you need to determine, you know, the extent or, or the length of the community sentence and give reasons for that. And these reasons have to be separate from the reasons that you gave when you passed the imprisonment sentence. Um, once that is done, um, you would think uh, you'd be done, but you're not. Because in the Slovenian system, when you pass an imprisonment sentence, the case is closed and it is relegated to the prison administration and it's, it's over. When a community sentence is passed, the case is not actually closed until the community sentence is served. And the judge making the decision gets reports from the probation service about what's going on with, um, with the community sentence and so on. And the case is only closed after the um, sentence has been served, um, which you know, might not look like much trouble. But actually, if you're a judge and if you're under pressure of how many um, decisions you make in what kind of time frame, um, having a case closed or not may actually be really, really relevant and important in making your decision. Okay, um, the, second, the second example that might be more relatable um, to people not knowing Slovenia intimately um, is the, the example of a guilty plea. So um, th there's different um, impacts that, that a guilty plea, that there's different influences. No, there's different decisions to be influenced by uh, the concept of a guilty plea. It of course influences the defendant and this is an area that has been researched over and over and, and still has to be researched more probably. Um, so it serves as an inducement. You know, you offer a reward to the defendant to making a choice and, and the choice is you know, to, to plead guilty. Um, and and the, the reward is the redu reduction of the sentence. 
when we think about the judge, we don't necessarily think about um, um, guilty pleas having um, um, an impact on, on their sentencing decision, other than the fact that, well, actually, when you have a guilty um, guilty plea, you need to discount for whatever, 30% or whatever the, the um, agreed um, rate is. Uh, but actually, I think it works um, as a nudge, probably, as well, um, in, you know, uh, Young's taxonomy. Um, so why? Uh, because there's lots of ways why taking a guilty plea, accepting a guilty plea, makes your life as a judge easier. Uh, than having, you know, uh, um, than rejecting it does. So, you know, the case is closed much faster. You avoid the lengthy trial. You avoid of, more often than not having to give reasons for the decision. Again, you have no appeals um, or you may, but, but it's, it's probably not going to be um, appealed. Um, so it makes your life as, you know, you have another case in your docket um, and, and that, that um, shows that you're a good judge. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of appeal in taking a guilty plea, even when you might have some some doubts about its you know, um, genuinity or, or um, your doubts um, are easier to appease because making that decision is easier for you. It makes your life as a decision maker um, easier. Okay, so what is that environment? You know, we've had examples now of what const constitutes um, the environment. Uh, definitely what we've talked about, the substantive or the sentencing law um, that often um, terms uh, functions in a coercive way. So the judge cannot avoid um, uh, considering that. Uh, but more than that, there is uh, procedural sentencing law, there's structural law, but there's also aspects that are not quite law or not law at all. And we have the defaults, um, which, which would be some sort of, you know, sentencing culture. Um, what, what is the, the system sentencing culture? As I said, for Slovenia, our, our sentencing culture probably favors the conditional sentence. As, uh, whereas, I don't know, in, in, in England and Wales, the sentencing culture probably favors an imprisonment sentence. Um, or, you know, in the Netherlands, the sentencing culture probably favors um, a, 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 a community sen sentence or, or something similar. Um, there's expectations you as a judge or as a decision maker has to ha have to uh, fulfill or have to meet um, expectations within your um, judicial community, within your peers, uh, within the group of your peers or the wider public. Um, there's a matter of self-preservation, you know, making the easier choices, the, the choices that make your life easier. Um, there's um, a, que a question of remand decisions that I, I mentioned before, and there's probably lots, lots and lots and lots and lots more um, in the not law um, um, cluster. Um, all of this, of course, um, somehow combines with, with the earlier notion of having the underground level, which would be the individual level. So if this is the above ground, if this is what we see, um, it all lays on something that's beneath. And beneath that, we have individual judicial characteristics that may make you more prone to make one some kind of decisions than, than other kinds of decisions. Um, I'm, of course, not saying that this is you know how um, judges generally approach sentencing. I'm not saying this is, you know, a judge making a decision thinks, wait, my life is going to be easier if I make that choice. But I, I, what I'm saying is that I think it actually does have an influence. As Kahneman says, you know, most of our decisions lie below the surface that, that we see. Um, and, and that surface, that environment is shaped by these um, clusters that we've um, talked about. Um, now, if we think about um, how this relates, this, this is the final diagram, I promise. Um, if we think about um, how, how that fits within a broader framework, um, if you see this, the two small circles um, in the left corner, that's the, the, the sentencing decision that we had on a previous slide. Uh, so the judge making the sentencing decision and it sits within a sentencing environment. The sentencing environment itself, however, sits in a wider 
environment that I, you know, very um, specifically termed society, because <laughs> I don't know what all goes there. It, it's basically everything. Um, and part of that framework is the law as well. So the law is part of the sentencing environment as well. That's a triangle that I've so, you know, uh, craftily um, um, drawn, so it intersects with, with the sentencing environment. Um, so part Part of the sentencing environment is the law, but not the entirety of the sentencing environment is the law, okay? Um, I, and I think this diagram is helpful in, in, in showing or in, in making us think about that. Another thing that this diagram can help us with is thinking about the decision maker. We think about the sentencer as being the main decision maker in making the sentence, but really the sentencer place within a playground set by someone else. So if, you know, if I um, give my children uh, a coloring book to color and they choose to color one of the pictures, yes, they were the ones choosing to color one of the pictures, but I was the one making that environment for them. I gave them the, the sentencing book. I gave them the choices that, that they were um, able to make. Um, so the, this uh, white circle um, on the outside of the sentencing environment would be the policymaker or the legislator, depending on, on the legal system that we're talking about, um, which often gets off the hook in sentencing. In, in, you know, we don't often think about them influencing sentencing um, very specifically, whereas we probably should um, incorporate them um, more, um, more and more. Um, finally, if we go back, to our London maps. Um, and we think um, about the um, topography uh, that would be, you know, the, the satellite um, image. Um, you know, let, let's start, um, let's start um, with the sewage lines and the tube, uh, the, the underground. So these are the things we don't necessarily think about having an impact on what life in London is like. But actually, well, not the tube. We know how, how relevant the tube is. Um, but the sewage lines, definitely not, or the water lines um, uh, go, going uh, beneath London. Um, so those, this is the sentencing architecture that's not the law that we don't usually think about. The, the topography, the roads, the buses, this is basically what we see when we look at the law. It's It's... Um, it's the rules um, that bind decision makers. So it's the part of choice architecture that, um, um, that is part of the law, that the, the law is part of. Um, when we go beyond that, when we choose um, uh, which pubs to put on the map or which landmarks to put on the map or which, you know, where to murder someone, um, this is a question of an individual choice. And it's still lays on the foundation of the different um, uh, maps that, that we've mentioned before. So, you know, underneath the murder slide, uh, underneath the murder map, there's, there's the tube map, there's the bus, map, bus routes map, there's the bicycle um, lanes map, there's the sewage map. Um, it, it all um, somehow combines together uh, into the decision um, about, about the murder as well. Not, you know, or let's use the pub because it's, it's somehow nicer. So when I'm deciding um, which pub to go to, I, I don't necessarily know about all that lies beneath. And it's probably not everything that impacts my decision, but some of those issues may impact my decision. And I think it's worth thinking about how some of those issues that we don't necessarily think about impact on sentencing as well. Thank you, Moitza, for that. Um, luckily, you don't have to go to pub these days, so you don't have to have these many decisions. But um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And